All right. So, um, as I said, uh, this is the last so far uh, for now in the um, series on Russian TV commercials. And um, I like ending with this because of all the uh, things advertised after 1991, this is the category that raised the most eyebrows and concerns. Um, this, is, this is a topic that, um, spur, that continues to, to um, spur a sort of flurry of, of anxiety about what about the children? And in particular, what about the little boys watching this? Um, how are we supposed to explain all this? Um, and I like to think about that because while I'm obviously unsuited for this topic in um, one major way, I'm very well suited for this other one where we're talking about, you know, what will the boys think? Um, I am the youngest of four brothers. There just was not very much menstruating going on in my house. Um, just my mom, who really didn't have much of a reason to bring it up, so um, she didn't talk about it. Menstruation was really the only thing that was actually completely new to me in sixth grade sex, sex ed class. I had no idea. Um, but um, learning about menstruation did help me um, understand one important thing that had always been a mystery to me and know that mystery was not women, that mystery was commercials. Um, because it was in the 1970s, on American television in the 1970s, there were lots of commercials for tampons, pads, douches, and my favorite phrase, feminine napkins. At the time, I remember thinking that feminine napkins must be napkins that just have lots of lace on them and are really pretty. Um, otherwise, what was all this about? It clearly had something to do with wearing a nightgown while walking on the beach because all the packaging and all the commercials had women in nightgowns walking on the beach. Um, this was also the aesthetic of the popular Gothic novel at the time, but the Gothic novel had women in nightgowns watching on the, walking on the beach, beach at night and the feminine hygiene commercials and packaging had women walking in nightgowns on the beach by day. So somehow there must have been some sort of pact between the two as to who, who, who got the beach when. Um, and I remember at the time thinking maybe it was the night nightgowns themselves. I also remember seeing a, a Massengill commercial um, where a younger woman says to her mother, mom, sometimes I don't feel fresh. I asked my mother about that one, but I don't remember what she said. And it wasn't so much prudery as it was lack of preparation for thinking that this could be relevant. By the time I was a teenager, I knew, I knew lots of things, um, very personal things about my parents, like they're turning condoms into water balloons on their honeymoon and dropping them from the balcony, um, and exactly which failed birth control devices led to the birth of myself and my next older brother. Um, so it wasn't just reticence, um, but it, I did manage to grow up with this blind spot that was constantly being um, that is constantly being reminded of by commercials. So it's not so much that I sympathize with the critique, but I empathize um, with the critique. Um, so, but why make this the subject of my last TV commercial lecture? Um, well, think about it. Um, there've been so many cases where we've been talking about with commercials from the Soviet time onward, where the commercial is an art object advertising something that's almost non-existent, like with banking or MMM or all the products you couldn't buy in, um, in the Soviet Union. Um, or as an alternative, you, um, the commercial were trying to create a new demand for a very physical object that didn't exist in the market before, such as Snickers. Um, and here with feminine hygiene pro products, we have a consumer economic sector where the pent up demand is really obvious, but the neglect has been, uh, has been really profound. Um, and where we can see the result, not just of disdain for consumer goods, but outright sexism, which in the Soviet context get linked together a lot who in Soviet times was going to make feminine hygiene products a priority? Who was even going to talk about them? Um, the sexism is, is um, related to, to the idea that, that women's concerns were barely concerns. And so they did not register um, very well in, in planning of, of um, production and supplies. Um, so there's the sexist aspect, but there's also a larger question that isn't just about sexism and isn't just about um, misogyny, um, but it's about what um, Mikhail Bakhtin so delicately refers to as the lower bodily stratum. The lower bodily stratum is basically that part of the body that you can't see on Zoom unless you have the misfortune of Zooming with Jeffrey Tubin. Um, it's everything that's related to um, reproduction and, and excretion of all kinds. Um, and Bakhtin, of course, very famously talks about how the, how um, how uh, carnival and parody um, will point to the lower bodily stratum as a way of making fun of someone. Even though we all have that stratum, um, just reminding um, someone, oh, you have that too, um, is a way of uh, taking them down a peg, as it were. The USSR, I would argue, never took this entire stratum at all seriously. Toilet paper, nah. Diapers, contraceptives, decent bathrooms. This was an entire sphere that was relegated to the unclean, unmentionable, and therefore unimprovable. 
Of course, bathrooms are disgusting. What you do in them is disgusting. So why would you expect them to be any better than they are? It all, the entire lower bodily stratum and everything related to it ends up almost extra discursive outside the sphere of civilization, outside of modernity and outside of planning. And it's also extra discursive uh, on a meta level in that they don't even have a good uh, discourse for its exclusion. It's not original sin. It's not a church thing. Um, there's nothing about so technically about Soviet modernity um, or communism or socialism or Soviet ideology um, that should make all of this unspeakable. But all that means is there's not even any grounds on which to challenge the unspeakability. The unspeakability is pre-discursive or at least pre-Soviet discursive. There's no God, no doctrine, no quotes from Lenin or Marx. Um, the lower bodily stratum in the USSR therefore suffers from a profound under-theorization. Um, you just can't put it into words and you can't put it into the economic planning and you can't take care of it. You can't make it any better. It's just um, this, this set of things that we do not talk about. So. That's one reason I, I want to talk about this stuff. And of course, for that, we could also look at, as I said, diapers and toilet paper and so on and so forth. So interestingly, and I could be wrong about this, um, toilet paper being this, this big symbolic um, shortage in the Soviet Union, at least from, from the outside, the thing people always talked about, um, I haven't noticed a huge phenomenon of toilet paper commercials. Um, which is which I, I do need to investigate. Um, but there's another reason that I wanted to do a, a lecture on feminine hygiene products, and that has to do with the um, the uh, call for suggestions I put out on Facebook when I first came up with the idea of doing this series of lectures. I said, what kind of, what commercials would you like to see? And I got um, some of them are ones we've already seen. And um, a couple of them um, had to do with feminine hygiene and one in particular, um, people kept coming back to um, because it is so hysterical. Um, and this is in a way, the most famous Russian commercial um, outside of Russia, except it's not a Russian commercial at all. Um, and it is a commercial for Tampax involving sharks. Um, so I'm going to show you this commercial and then I'll tell you a little bit about the backstory here. All right, so I'm gonna share the screen, share sound, okay, share, there we go. All right, are we ready? Here we go. Yeah, so um, there's so much wrong with this commercial, um, not just what's objectionable about it, but just as a kind of, um, as, a, as an aquatic scene, it makes no sense. What is a shark that's that big doing so close to, um, to the to land and why is it jumping so high when this tender morsel is right there, whatever. Um, but it's set up for us, um, even though the letters are in, in English, as a Russian commercial. And, I, and it's a huge hit on the internet. And I think most people who see it assume that it is a Russian commercial for Tampax. However, it is not. Um, it's also not Russian. It's not a real commercial. It comes from a movie called Movie 43 that came out in 2013. Movie 43 is a set of um, a collection of sketch comedies and an amazing number of really talented, great people came together to make this truly terrible movie. I've only seen pieces of it, but um, it's famously bad. And the pieces I've seen have um, really confirmed that even though it has people like Kristen Bell and um, all these wonderful people in it. Um, and this commercial is the culmination of a sketch called Middle School Date. Um, uh, in which there's a middle school, uh, a girl is over at um, a guy's house for a date and she um, has her period and she has a stain and this whole thing and um, everybody freaks out and then it ends with this commercial. Um, and the result here is that I think very few people remember this movie because it's, it's, it's really bad, but not quite bad in the kind of the room way in which like there's a cult following for it because it's actually trying to be funny and it's just mostly failing. Um, but I think really the only part of this film that has had mimetic success is the um, fake Tampax commercial, which lives on um, as a um, Russia themed meme on the internet. Um, it fits in really well with Russia as a, as a wonderland of internet weirdness, um, though it is completely unrepresentative of Russia's approach to um, to feminine hygiene commercials, which are um, frankly much more tasteful than that. Um, 
All right, so let's talk about the actual commercials. What's, what, were, what were the companies that were bringing these products to the market actually doing? Um, and what we're gonna find is none of these commercials are anywhere near as fun as um, the Tampax Shark commercial. Um, in fact, um, a lot of them should seem fairly familiar if you've ever seen um, a similar commercial uh, in the West. Um, there's not a huge amount that's, that's different. Um, but I want to start with a, with a commercial for Always Plus, which does something that most of the commercials, the later commercials will not do, which is have a very long explanation talking to a woman um, about, um, about the pad and explaining why it's a very good thing. So. Always Plus. Это абсолютно новое ощущение. Я, я почувствовала разницу. Юля открыла для себя прокладки Always Plus. Always Plus снабжены крылышками, которые заворачиваются за края белья. Раньше, когда я пользовалась обычными прокладками, я перестирала свое белье по 2-3 раза. Только у прокладок Always есть верхний слой драйвив, переходящий на крылышки. Этот уникальный пористый слой быстро пропускает влагу внутрь и препятствует ее выходу наружу. Поверхность остается практически сухой и чистой, и даже если влага попадет на края, широкие крылышки Always Plus помогут защитить ваше белье. Я чувствую, что я под защитой. То есть я вообще забываю в данный момент, что то есть у меня какие-то вот сложности. Мне так же сухо, так же комфортно, так же свежо, так же чисто. И плюс чистое белье. То есть нет проблем со стиркой. Always. Сухие, чистые и надежные. Помимо Always Plus, представляем Always Super Plus. Эти прокладки удлинены с обеих сторон для более надежной защиты в случаях, когда это необходимо. So, again, um, pretty straightforward. Um, note that we're actually talking with what is presumably a real Russian woman who is not presented here as particularly glamorous. I'm not trying to, to you know, put her down or anything, but she, she actually seems like a real person. Um, and uh, she's simply sitting there for the interview. Um, there's a fair amount of circumlocution going on, you know, when you really need it, those days and so on and so forth. And um, two particular features that are common to um, ads from the time around the world, but are particular, were particularly noted um, uh, in, on Russian television. Um, one, the blue liquid, um, the famous blue liquid to um, take the place of menstrual bl blood because blue is perfect because Bodies don't produce blue liquid, so there's no scandal. And then the fra the the wings, the krulishki, the whole the the the, the wings of the, the wings of the pads became a kind of winged phrase um, in Russia at the time, um, and, and lots of sort of um, snide comments about about the wings. Um, one thing that does stand out about this unremarkable ad is that this one was, there's no doubt that this ad is made for the Russian market. Um, and um, it's, it is definitely very localized and it's trying to do a kind of um, a kind of like a general a crash course introduction to what these things are and why you should buy them. Um, so really, really informative. Um, and then we're going to, from there though, we go to uh, commercials that just, uh, that try to make things a bit more fun. Um, если действовать нужно немедленно, спасти может только Котекс. Котекс – быстрый способ спасти ситуацию. So fun, lighthearted, and also the our first example of what's going to be a set of um, very familiar. Um, motifs here, which is basically supermodels wearing white, running around, smiling, and having fun. Um, and what that means, that means a few things here. Um, one is it's not that different from what you'd find in other countries. And two, it's always possible with a lot of these commercials, this one, this one included, that this could have been made for another market and then um, dubbed over in Russian. Um, I didn't see many things that would that would say to me this is specifically taking place in Russia. Um, and in fact, the um, the more um, these commercials lean towards a certain type of glamour that we're going to see, um, the more it really could be um, a kind of, dare I say, cosmopolitan um, approach, as we're going to see in the next one. <laughs> Все 
So pretty straightforward, but now we have that emphasis on women and groups, um, uh, supporting each other, having fun, being lighthearted, being sexy, um, being a, a kind of aspirational thing um, of, a, of a certain type of um, fun and friendship um, that we're never going to leave, I think, for the rest of, um, of this lecture here, um, as we'll see when we get to Libres. <laughs> Брэс Инвизибл идеально повторяют контуры женского тела и отлично впитывают, обеспечивая надежную защиту от протекания. Когда ты уверена, ты смеешься больше. Теперь Либрес Инвизибл не только с мягкой поверхностью, но и с поверхностью сеточка. So that was quite over the top with how much fun they're having. They can't stop laughing. And the music, I think, is directly from Sex in the City. Um, if it's not, it's very, very close. Um, so again, that sort of aspirational thing. By this point, between this ad and the one with the, um, with the rodent and the glass, um, feminine hygiene projects become a kind of hidden superpower that these women have that they can take out and then um, use. And, and the men are just left puzzled by, um, by the, uh, the magic that these, that these women are deploying. And it's all part of the, part of the great joke. Um, okay, now a real Tampax commercial. Некоторым девушкам не нужно объяснять, как достичь комфорта. Ведь они выбрали Tampax. Благодаря гладкому аппликатору с ним легко и удобно. Tampax дает комфорт и надежную защиту. Yes, now Tampax can even fight the scourge of, of uh, man spreading. Um, Эти дни возьми уби, а говорят пользоваться тампонами ежедневно вредно. Кто сказал? Моя подруга по танцам, мой косметолог, мне Гена сказал. А разве нет? Хватит верить слухам. Уби про комфорт созданы из дышащего материала натурального происхождения и рекомендованы гинекологами для ежедневного использования в критические дни. Уби про so here we, we go back to actually providing useful information, useful both for the consumer and also for the maker of the product. They want to make sure people are, women are using this um, every day um, that they need to. Um, so we have the, the, the uh, fun female community and um, um, the need to actually uh, fight um, unfounded rumor and so on and so forth. And, um, and there you go. This is a very recent one from 2019, starring Olga Buzova, who was a star of the, of the reality show Dom Dva. She's an Instagram influencer. And this commercial was really, really hated um, on the internet. Um, so that, that on its own makes it worth watching. Let's take a look here. Who made these women's rules? Don't wear black, and I'll be. Don't wear black, and I'll be. Don't dance, and I'll be. So, of course, taking advantage of her initials being OB, but basically, um, this is taking so many of the tropes of uh, at least 20 years of um, Russian uh, of advertising for um, feminine hygiene products and throwing them all together, the, the beautiful woman, the white outfits, um, and but emphasizing girl power in a way that um, really led to a backlash. It's interesting that these, when it's these groups of women who are not famous, who are hanging out, this doesn't lead to so much hostility, but maybe in part because a lot of people don't like Buzova anyway, but in part because it becomes so much about her that the girl power message um, coming from her um, about how, you know, she's not gonna let these rules define her um, ends up um, not really working in her favor or working in favor um, of the product. Okay. And finally, um, a different product category that, um, that we have not seen yet. Um, and this is for lactoseed. Сухость, раздражение, запах в интимной зоне портит настроение и доставляет дискомфорт. Для правильного интимного ухода доверься лактоциду, как это уже сделали миллионы женщин во всем мире. Выбери свой лактоцид на каждый день. 
So um, perhaps because of the nature of the product, this is doing something different from the other commercials, which is um, encouraging a bit of shame um, in order to, uh, um, to get women to actually buy the product. Um, I haven't seen much reaction to this commercial, but I could imagine it might be fairly mixed. Um, so these commercials, I think you'll agree, a lot of them are fairly standard. What's interesting here um, in uh, the Russian media world is the, is the reception that the, that the whole phenomenon of these commercials had. Um, there's a real tension between the glamour and fun of the ads, the comfort that the ads proclaim, and the discomfort that surrounds them as a phenomenon. Uh, in 1998, for example, Moscow, the Moscow Times ran, ran an article called Feminine Hygiene Ads Annoy Russian Viewers. Um, I'm going to quote from it. Last November, the New Social Psychology Institute conducted a survey among 2,200 residents of central Russian cities. It revealed that television viewers find advertisements for feminine hygiene products more disturbing than those for any other product. Of those who polled, 45.2% reported feeling irritated by the ads for sanitary napkins and tampons. The next most irritating subject was chewing gum, with a distaste rating of only 4.1%. Perhaps the most revealing result of the study was that 60.5% of women respondents said they were bothered by the ads. Svetlana uh, Ivaz, um, Ivazova, an expert for women of Russia, said they shouldn't have depicted everything so openly right away. In one ad, there's a text that says, I feel clean and dry for the first time. What is that supposed to mean? That she wasn't clean for all these years? That without these napkins, we ran around wild? They simply drive women away with this message. An advertisement should conform to a country's culture and take women's feelings into consideration. Um, now, according to figures According to figures from the Russian Public Relations Group, advertising for feminine hygiene products took up 2.55% of all Russian TV advertising in 1988, which is significantly more than in the West at the time, which meant that people proportionately were seeing a lot more of this stuff. Um, and the advertisers were justifying this by saying that until recently, a few in Russia were aware of the, the category. Um, but there are people writing him letters saying, I'm very irritated by the fact that my child sees these ads. Once when he was six years old after watching another of these commercials, he thought for a long time and then asked, what is it that's always leaking out of you women there? It was very unpleasant for me. Um, around 2017, there was a change.org petition to ban these commercials in Russia, though it only got 50 signatories. In 2014, a deputy in the Duma, Roman Hudyukov, called for a ban on them. And in, um, in 2017, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, yes, that Zhirinovsky, called for a ban on advertisement of um, uh, feminine hygiene products. Um, to be fair, he also was uh, crusading against, uh, I guess we call them natural male enha enhancements. Um, so um, he's saying that, that uh, viewers should not have to be forced to see all of this. Um, and interestingly also, I found um, a, uh, a blog post by someone, I don't know this person, um, with the with the great title the USSR did not have pads and diapers, but it did have uh, work and paychecks. And the whole article um, is about how yeah yeah people go on about how we didn't have this stuff, but is that really so important right back when we had um, you know full employment and socialized medicine and all that? As if these two things are somehow um, in complementary distribution um, and setting up an interesting straw woman here that is it somehow. The, the, the very phenomenon of um, these various products for that lower bodily stratum um, are only possible um, if, uh, thanks to the destruction of state socialism, that it's inconceivable to have them together, and that therefore valuing this sort of thing is um, frivolous, right? Um, politically naive, um, and uh, part of a whole process that, is, that um, shows the degradation of the, of the country. That is a lot for a set of products to have writing on them. But most interesting um, is, of course, Vladimir Putin, um, back when he was running for president in the year 2000. Now, um, it may be hard to remember this, but back then, um, Putin was much less comfortable with the being in the media um, than he became. Um, and in particular, um, was really uncomfortable with the idea of being part of an actual um, election campaign. And he complained that he did not want to have to be packaged like Snickers or Tampax. Um, that, that, you know, uh, all of these commercials, all this television is just is about, as he put it, which is better, Snickers or Tampax, which is an interesting question because I'm not sure who would actually um, raise the question that way. Um, and that being marketed um, as the, as the um, potential, um, not acting, but real president of the, of the country was somehow beneath his dignity. 
Um, and comparing it to Snickers or, um, or Tampax is interesting here because these are both ordinary consumer products for huge parts of the population dest destined for what one might consider an undignified insertion. Um, in other words, what the indignity of all of this, if you combine Snickers of all things with tampons, um, is the indignity of, a mar of both the market and to some extent democracy um, in that it is about putting the bodily and personal needs of, of sets of people first, um, rather than say the needs of some abstract state. Um, Tampax and Snickers are weirdly parallel in a lot of ways here. Um, they're each about the body and its needs, and they each situate the body in terms of commodification. Um, and they each create an extended narrative of group fun and a carefree, exciting, glamorous life. Snickers is less objectionable because it's food, it's oral, but it's also, interestingly enough, being marketed for guys, right? I mean, presumably women in Russia and women around the world are eating Snickers, but you wouldn't really know that so much from the Snickers commercials that we looked at a few lectures ago. Um, the lifestyle that this particular consumer object uh, meant for just about everybody. The lifestyle here is um, for groups of fun-loving young guys. Um, Snickers helps guys deploy their bodies in space and find limitless energy. Whereas Tampax and the related products, those are for girls, obviously, and it's all unmentionable. Um, but it's actually, the, the ads themselves are trying to convey the same sense of freedom, group uh, friendship and agency. Um, the irony is that it's, um, it's the feminine hygiene ads that cause the greatest discomfort, even though um, arguably they're for products that are much more essential than Snickers, right? Um, people can do without Snickers just fine and don't need to find a substitute Snickers. Um, Tampax and other brands are marketing products to meet an obvious need that the culture would prefer to ignore. So it is Tampax that ends up uh, excessive, superfluous, and offensive um, for the same reason that feminine hygiene never really made it into the five-year plans. Men don't have to think about it and think they should not have to see it or think about it. Um, and the fact of these commercials is a challenge to that. All right, um, that's all I wanted to say about that. So I will stop sharing the screen. And I'm happy to take questions or comments. Um, I have um, a question and a couple of comments. As far as replacing red with blue, um, it's not just fresh water and so on. Blue is the color of the Madonna in iconography from the medieval, especially the Renaissance period. So this really evokes a kind of, if you want, a feminine ideal, okay? Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, I did not remember that Putin compared himself or a campaign that would advertise him to a choice between Snickers and Tampax. And what I found fascinating when I saw the ad, which mercifully I had not seen before, I thought it was an ad for Putin. <laughs> because what you have is this huge shark, right? Uh, <laughs> totally out of place, right? Um, simply swallowing a smaller, weaker, unsuspecting victim politically, it is an ideal commercial, I think, for Putin, okay? Mm. And finally, I have a question. What do you think advertisements are meant to do? John Berger, who is one of my ideal commentators, has said that an advertisement does not advertise the product. What it does is it advertises a desirable future self, mm -hmm. right? Um, and presumably acquiring this product will enable you to reach that ideal self. Do you agree with that? Do you see other, other scenarios behind these ads or ads in general? Thank you. I basically agree with that, but I think what, it, what um, the post-Soviet case really shows because of the um, switch to market economy is that, is that even if on the whole, the discourse of advertising is selling you um, a version of yourself, selling you a lifestyle, selling you, um, uh, um, selling you what the product can help you transform into. There are certain moments when the product is new that they actually have to talk about the thing itself. Um, uh -huh. 
and and I don't think those are, I don't think advertisers really enjoy that as much as they enjoy everything else. Like um, mm-hmm. it, uh, obviously with these ads, right? It's much more fun to just show these women out there having fun and living this carefree life than explaining exactly how a pad or a tampon works. Um, but presumably, when something is new on the market, there is that moment when you actually have to do it. Um, and they jumped over that moment fairly quickly when they could. Um, yes, but, I think they did. Mm-hmm. But, they, they, but still, um, it's particularly, I think, with products that have um, a real physical existence, which um, Snickers and, and Tampax do, unlike almost everything else I've looked at in the series. Um, yes, it still fits in with, with what John Berger is saying, but I think there's something about the thing um, that has to get a little bit more attention, at least at some stages, um, uh, than if the thing being sold is a little more abstract. Even with Snickers, right? You know, no matter how you slice it, you see mm. peanuts and so on and so forth. Um, a little bit of attention has to be paid to the thing. But yes, overall, of course, it's about a version of you, um, a better you that you can have when you when you use these things. And also possibly on the national scale is that we, Ruskia, we have this, you know, or I suppose I should say in this instance, right? Uh, we are not behind. We also have access to this. And so we are no worse. Plus we can accompany it with music, with, you know, semi-exposed boobs, just like anyone else. Absolutely. So yeah, operating on two levels, the individual and the national. Okay, anyway, I really enjoy this. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And we have a question from Nadia Kitsenko. Nadia, I'll ask you to unmute. Hey, Nadia. Thanks. Hey, Elliot. Um, so did they do any market research? Like, where did they get the woman who, as you say, looks normal? I mean, I really want to know. Like, what, like what, what, what was the casting call? Like, any, any of those details? Oh, I, I, I would like to know that too. And I don't know any of that because as I've said with previous things, um, I'm not doing really serious research for the stuff. I just want to make that clear up front. I, I'm finding stuff on the internet, right? Um, so I'm sure there's work out there that I would hope there's work out there that actually talks about um, what happens in particular when it comes to bringing feminine hygiene products to the post-Soviet space um, because it's such a such a big shift. There must have been some sort of market research being done. Um, as far as this woman goes, I would have just I would just guess that, you know, you've been casting, you're looking for someone who looks relatable, who can talk, you know. Um, I, I said she looks like a normal person. I'm sure she's an actress, um, but um, but she but at least um, looks like she lives in the same world as the rest of us, as opposed to a lot of the other women in these other commercials who just um, who to me feel like they almost don't have a reality off the screen right because they're just too they're just too glamorous but yeah i'd love to know more absolutely there's a there's a um a, a book I, I got recently um it's the handbook of critical menstruation studies which was something i did not know existed um but i don't remember seeing anything on on russia in it hi elliot um, I'm not an academic, but um, I'm retired and I have time to come to these cool lectures now. Um, and I also was a fellow Russian major with Elliot at Oberlin College. And um, I'm a little rusty now, but um, with the ad with the shark, I really love that ad, but what did it say? Did it say Tampax doesn't protect you? Is that what it says at the end? Uh, oh, no, no, I don't remember. Because if that's what it said, I thought it was very clever because maybe yeah. it protected her from, you know, menstrual flow, but not from a sudden ta- shark attack. Yeah. And yeah. Movie Jaws is about to show at our local historic theater this oh. week. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's really great. But actually, um, I thought it was clever because it, it's something totally unexpected that has nothing to do with the product, but it really sticks in your mind and makes you remember the brand. So I thought that was effective. But It um, does. It, mm-hmm. it, what's funny about it is how how it's focusing on something and doing the exact opposite of what these sort of commercials usually do, which is tell you, no, you think you can't go swimming or no, you think you can't do this, but you can. Um, and here it's focusing on look what happens if you don't um, use this protection because then you're gonna get eaten by a shark. So it's taking, I mean, it's taking um, the stuff of these commercials and turning it on, on, its, on its head into something funny and frightening. But Adrian, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Oh, so she she got attacked because she was not using it. I was thinking she used it, but she still got oh, attacked. No, I, I'm thinking, I'm assuming she didn't use it. If she'd worn Tampax, she'd be alive today. Maybe, yeah. 
<laughs> and I also thought that the rodent was very strange because like in Baltimore where I live, you know, we don't, we have way too many rats and uh, <laughs> saving the rodent was, was a strange, I thought, idea. But um, and then, <laughs> um, the, the thing with, that, I, that really stuck out with me, uh, the comparison between the first ad and the other ads, um, was that the women, uh, as you mentioned, the first woman looks more like a real person, not really glamorous. And the other ones were also, you know, skinny, like supermodels, and so silly and girly, giggly. And uh, that, um, I think when the la other lady, uh, Nadezhda asked, what is advertising actually advertising? They're advertising also like the way women are supposed to behave and look, you know, mm -hmm. and like, that's what really stuck with me. That's how you're yeah. supposed to be. And that's very oppressive. Like I even had an eating disorder when I was younger, partly probably because of these sort of subliminal mm -hmm. messages that I got oh, from watching lots of TV. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. But I think it's two parts, advertising like what you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to look like. And then the rewards you get from that, right? Because then you get all these girlfriends, right? And you get to have this great time. Um, I, I think it's it's interesting that it's not just showing like one single skinny, beautiful woman being glamorous. Um, it's a whole crew of glamorous women together. So you get um, you get you get you get to have the friends as well as having the body and everything. So yeah, it's selling it's selling a a really um, pernicious <laughs> um, story. Yeah, but good topic. Thank you, Elliot. Well, oh, thank you. And I think that was Sex and the City music in the background. I mean, it's. Certainly heard it enough. <laughs> Hi, Elliot. Thanks again, and uh, thanks, Sasha. Elliot, I wonder if uh, something to look at in the future might be the uh, the use of well, like uh, you see it on the internet. Uh, I guess the example that I would use that most of us are familiar with is when Yuri Dude does an an ad of something right uh -huh. in the middle of a program. That's become very popular throughout the internet. Uh -huh. uh, I'm a slap bassist fan, <laughs> and so. <laughs> uh, Davey 504 and Charles Bertou do these kind of ads. Yeah. Also chess like Anna Rudolph, the Hungarian, they'll, they'll do these ads in the middle of their program. And just for future, I wonder if there, there'd be something there that would be, you know, uh, worth looking at in terms of how these kind of things are advertised. That, that is really interesting because what, what I, I find so fascinating about this phenomenon, you, you certainly, you see it in the videos you talk about, you hear it in podcasts all the time, um, is it's a return actually to the, the old days of radio. I mean, when I was, when I was young, the, the, one, the one holdover we had from really old radio was Paul Harvey. Um, and Paul Harvey who was, would do his shtick and then he would just read an advertisement for some product. In the old radio days, um, the radio announcers would, interrupt what they're doing and show for a product and then come back to, uh, to what they were doing and now on the internet with podcasts we have this return not only do we have product place which is a whole other thing but we have this thing where the person that, or people that you are coming to hear or see are now being the pitch people um and yeah that is absolutely fascinating i, I haven't i mean i've seen dudes do it i haven't seen that much um of it for, um, in russian stuff i'm always impressed by the people um, in the podcast that I listened to who were able to turn this into a kind of fun thing, um, like the uh, Crooked Media people on Pod Save America or um, in the old days, Starly Kine on Mystery Show. Um, but it's, it's a, 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 new, a new old burden on the content providers. Um, so yeah, there's, there's probably some great stuff to look at for that. Hi, Elliot. Hi, everyone. Oh, thanks for the lecture. <laughs> I remember many of those commercials vividly from when I was growing up in Russia in the 1990s. And maybe it, may, it does make sense that I still remember uh, them given how, well, as you just said, how often they were shown on TV. And so I wanted, I wanted, to, I wanted to hear from you more about whether, whether these commercials in fact induce or do not induce a sense of shame in women. As I was, yeah, as I was listening uh, to the original, well, to the original Russian language uh, of the ads, I was reminded of, of the euphemisms that, that had been continuously used uh, in those. Because, and I also, as I was, listen, as I was just watching them and, lis and listening, I was trying had to quickly remember when was the last time I, I've seen a, a, a hygiene, well, a menstrual, a menstrual product commercial on, an Amer on, on the American TV. And I don't remember recently, it, it must've been recently, but I don't remember which one it was. But let's assume, let's assume that here, uh, you can hear words such as menstruation or period uh, mm -hmm. in those ads. But in the Russian commercials you just showed, 
they never they never actually use these words. They don't. They did not use the Russian words for period, message, right, or uh, menstruation. Uh, they call they use euphemisms. They call it they call them what well whatever it was critical what, days. TV, right critical days. Yeah. Well, in fact, there's well there's nothing really critical about <laughs> the most natural the most yeah. natural process that many most women live with, right? Yeah. And there's and yet that yes, and I remember it now that critical days is the word that became that was popularized by these commercials. I don't think it existed before. Um, yeah, and, and and other and even even in that early always commercial with this supposedly regular average uh, relatable woman in it, I, she also did not use did not say why exactly she appreciated the product so much. She said, "When I experience difficulties, right? When сложности." Uh, and that that's when it helps her and so yeah so uh so it is real I, I found it really interesting how how yes these commercials might have uh well definitely probably uh seemed too outrageous to the people uh, well at the time so they complained so much about them because they were too explicit because they showed what was not shown before but the way they talked about the subject still remained well, still kept the subject unspeakable in some in some ways. Uh, but I, uh, okay, I, I should probably stop here and really hear from you. Thanks. No, I, I think I, I completely agree with you on that. And um, I think what's funny then is if you if you look at it less from the point of less from a feminist point of view at the moment and more from a sort of culturally conservative um, point of view, then actually um, these commercials are very clever in their restraints. Um, rather than how far they're pushing the boundaries, right? They're still using so much circumlocution, which ironically brings me back to the hypothetical confused little boy and the confused little boy I was. Like, the more you have these euphemisms, the more you think, what, what are these critical days? Am I going to have these critical days? Like, if you would just say um, what is actually happening, um, the whole thing might be, uh, might be simpler. Um, I have not, the latest ads that I've seen don't tend to be particularly explicit in the terminology. And again, um, I could be off on this because one of my problems with comparing to American commercials is that I haven't really watched broadcast television in, in over a decade, so I'm, I'm behind. Um, I have a general sense that's like right around the turn of the century uh, in America, feminine hygiene ads got a bit more explicit, like you'd hear the word vaginal. Um, and uh, more and specific uh, references to flows um, and menstrual flows and all that. Whereas um, in the years before, I, I kind of remember it being a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, evasive um, in the terminology. So I mean, one you know one thing you could say to the Russian critics here is that you think this is explicit. Just just imagine how much more explicit this really could be. Um, but then also, if you think in terms of what some of those critics were saying for, that I quoted from about like taking cultural context into account, then arguably, especially in the 1990s, when this is a whole new product category and advertising this stuff is so novel, they were taking the cultural context into account by being very careful in the sort of things that they would say, right? Um, possibly in order not to embarrass um, the women themselves who are who are, who are watching this. Now, um, whether or not women were embarrassed um, by the advertising, one thing that's very clear, whether it's the advertising or simply the fact of the product, um, uh, this entire industry did really, really well in Russia once these products were int introduced for the obvious reasons that, um, that uh, they, they, feel, they filled a need um, and women adopted them um, very, very readily which in turn could perhaps have changed the way they, they talk about it, but I don't know because the chances are they wouldn't be talking with me about it. And we have a question from uh, Olga Klimova. It looks like this group of feminine products targets mainly young women in their 20s, possibly early 30s. Have you encountered any commercials directed toward women in their late 30s to 40s and pre-menopause women? I have seen a decent number of US commercials targeting the second group of women, but can't personally recall from any can't personally recall any from Russia. Do you think there is a connection here to fertility and also to the taboo about active sex life after 50? Or is there something else at stake here? That's fascinating. Um, I'm not aware of commercials um, aimed towards that age group. Um, and I think in the United States, they are uh, more recent. Um, if we think in terms of, of uh, commercials being aspirational, um, then 
at the very least, one could assume that a group of women in their 20s and 30s can be aspirational for young women um, and not necessarily a negative for the older women who some of whom might want to identify with that um, with that group to some extent. Um, I haven't seen I haven't seen an emphasis on um, on older women, but I also haven't seen. And again, I'm not watching enough television, but um, I have not seen that much attention paid to older women as a market for anything um, in um, in Russian media and advertising. Um, and so either that means there's a niche that um, could be exploited um, or there's a feeling that there's no need to market um, towards them. But um, I would wonder if as the women who grew up watching these commercials um, get to be in their 40s and 50s if the um, advertising might start to target them as well. Um, early on, I would also imagine they, they're assuming that in, in, in the mid-90s, they're assuming that the, the early adopters of these products are not going to be women in their late 40s. Um, they're going to be women you know, in their teens and 20s. But that should be completely different by now. Okay, then. Well, thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure seeing you over these past several weeks. Um, again, I might return to advertising at some point in the future, but in any case, um, I wish you all a great summer and um, hope to see you at other Jordan Center events, either online or in person, and um, keep cool. <laughs>